Good to be in God's house this morning, amen, church? Let me invite our kids to head toward children's worship, our kindergarten through fifth graders. If you want to head that way, I see Mr. Harris and Ms. Kim over there waiting on you. If you, uh, like I say every week, if you have a kindergarten through fifth grader and you're here for the first time and they'd like to go to children's worship and you want to walk over with them, you're more than welcome to do that and then come back and join us. Uh, while they're doing that, go ahead and pull out your Bibles with me. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've got a lot of ground to cover this morning as we uh, continue on in this series. Um, this is our last uh, day in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, next week, guess where we go? That's awesome. Y'all are, y'all are awesome. We go to 2 Thessalonians next week. We're stepping verse by verse uh, through these two books. We've entitled this series, How Can I Be Sure?, And this morning, I want to talk about the corporate body of Christ, the church, and living Christianity. That's what I've entitled the sermon this morning, Living Christianity. Here's the scripture. Here's what it says. You can read along with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, We're going to cover a lot of ground, verses 12 through 28. It says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Verse 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every evil, from every form of evil. Verse 23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So we come to the end of 1 Thessalonians this morning. And like we said earlier, next week we begin 2 Thessalonians. And I want you to see something. In 1 Thessalonians, we have found this heartfelt letter from the Apostle Paul. And he's written it to this new and what I will call a fragile congregation of believers. This is about A.D., uh, in the year A.D. 50. And they were struggling to find their feet in light of this is the world they were living in, and honestly, it's the world we're living in now. Uh, They were struggling to find their feet in light of persecution, and they were also being accused. um, This is kind of historical background. They were being accused by the Jews who were in opposition to Paul's ministry for one fact and one reason, one reason alone, and that was because he was proclaiming that Jesus Christ was and is the Savior. They were standing in opposition to him. Uh, Remember back when we started this series, I can't believe it's been two months already, time flies, but two months ago when we started this series, Paul, uh, we said that Paul had been with the church at Thessalonica. He had been in Thessalonica and Thessalonica for three weeks after he planted the church. He's there 21 days, there about three weeks, and he has to leave, the Bible tells us he has to leave because of the persecution. He's run out of town. It was the best thing for him to leave for the church to be able to survive. So Paul's worried about the church, and what did we say that he did a couple of weeks into the series? He sends Timothy back to the church at Thessalonica to check on them. Now Timothy comes back to Paul, And he gives him good news. Uh, He gives him a good word about what's going on at Thessalonica. And so Paul uh, writes them from Corinth to encourage them further. And here's what Paul does. I want you to follow me. He gives them some insights about the nature of what the church is supposed to be. Now, I'm not a real smart guy, but I'm smart enough to know that if the Bible gives us some insights about what the church is supposed to be, We should listen to that. We should hear it. We should see it. And we should model the church after what the Bible tells us the church is supposed to be, right? Not what man makes up that the church, what he thinks the church ought to be. So here's here's the deal in the scripture. The Bible says that the congregation of God's people, that God's people, the church, 
are to be founded, listen to me real close, are to be founded on truth, that we're to be founded on faith, that we're to be founded on hope, and we're to be founded on love, right? I mean, the Scripture tells us that. And he gives us some insights into how to be effective in Christian ministry as the church. He, Paul has told them how they should live their lives individually and how that will affect the way that they live their lives corporately as the church. And how did he do that? We've been through several messages. This is the eighth week in the series. Uh, one of those weeks, uh, Paul had gotten a good word about the church. He said, but if you want to blow that up, if you want to mess that up, then step into sexual immorality. You remember that one about three weeks ago? He said, if you want to mess up the church, if God's people want, to, want for the church to be ineffective, then God's people need to be sexually immoral. And we, we spent a whole Sunday talking about what that means, that sexual immorality is more than just a, a, a husband having an affair on a wife or a wife having an affair on a husband. It touches us all in some ways, everything from pornography to homosexuality to whatever it may be. Paul says that... The, and Paul reminds us that God created sex and it's a good thing. And he said that God created that for Adam and Eve. But when Adam and Eve stepped into sin, there they were naked in the garden. Everything was great, but all that got messed up with sin. And so mankind views sex in the wrong way. So we, Paul said, you get that right. Understand that. The next week, we were on that mountaintop that week. We dipped down in the valley. Easy to skip over. But, but Paul said, oh, don't forget brotherly love. He said, don't forget that you're to love one another. If the church is going to be effective, we've got to love one another. We've got to treat each other the right way. Paul says, he gave some very practical steps in that. He said, you know, mind your own business. Don't worry, you know, don't look at the, don't look at the speck in the other person's eye when you've got a plank hanging out of yours. Paul said, you know, our relationships have to be the right way. And then last week, it was that mountaintop kind of message again. Last week, Paul uh, Paul sets all that he tells them against the big, huge backdrop. You remember what it was? It's all against the, it's the whole backdrop that Paul writes this letter from, and it's the return of Jesus Christ. So last week we talked about the day when Christ will return, when he will call his people home. The scripture tells us clearly about that, and, and that we should be prepared for what the Bible calls the parousia of Christ, the return of Christ in the air for those of us who our believers. The scripture calls it the snatching up. We often call it the rapture. And we said last week that's actually not a, a biblical word. It comes from the word harpazo, which means to snatch or to seize. And Paul is going to talk more about that next week when we get into 2 Thessalonians. Paul is going to remind us that we need to be prepared for the day of the Lord because judgment will follow. So Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't, uh, you know, Paul doesn't make any punches about all this. I mean, Paul cut straight to the chase, and he said it's all hinged upon the return of Christ, the way the church is supposed to be living out its days. But here today, and it's often Paul's custom, I want you to go here with me, Paul give, he's ending this first letter, and he, he gives some instructions. And, and I really think that here today in this scripture is some excellent learning to be gained from Paul's wisdom and from Paul's insight about what it means for us to live in Christian community together, to live Christianity out on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the very heart of his teaching is this idea that we are one family together, that God's people, we're a family. We've got each other. We need each other. We need to trust each other and rely on each other and stand together as the church, and Paul says that. In 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul uses the word brothers seven times. Five of those times are in this passage that we've just read this morning. So for those of us who know Christ, for those of us in this room this morning who are saved, if you're a believer, if you're a redeemed child of God, we are brothers and sisters together, aren't we, church? And we form the family of faith, and Paul told us to be careful how we live not to waver from the truth, to love one another, to comfort one another, to encourage one another, to build one another up, and to hold one another accountable. That's what he says in the Scripture. These are the hallmarks that describe the church. And now Paul moves on and he strengthens this notion with this teaching about how to live that out on a day-to-day -day basis. And in this final section, here's what we're going to see if you're taking notes. It's real simple in this Scripture this morning. Here's what Paul's going to show us about the corporate body of Christ, about the church. He's going to show us 
that, that, that there are three real hallmarks in this. Number one, how pastors or how church leaders and the members of the church should relate to one another. That's huge. That's important. Then he moves on and he's going to talk about how members, how the members of the body of Christ should relate to one another. And then he's going to talk about how the church should actually execute its public worship. So those are the three things that we're going to talk about this morning. So here we go. Let, let's have a look at what Paul says about living Christianity. And we're going to start off with what he starts off with, how the church is supposed to relate to those who are in leadership in the church. Now, we're going to begin to step verse by verse, and we're going to have to move pretty quick. I want to preface this part of it with this. Throughout the centuries, the church has approached this topic, this part of Scripture, very differently in different eras and with different denominations and in different churches. But here, y'all ready for the bottom line? It, I don't care what a denomination does. The church needs to be biblical in what it does. In some places and in some times, pastors and church leaders have often been treated like demigods who rule over a congregation, and what he says always goes. And in those cases, these fellows are put on a pedestal and made out to be all-wise type of beings, omnicompetent, and placed there by God to undertake the ministry of the church, while the congregation is supposed to just show up and offer support and do some cheerleading and throw some cash in a collection plate. Well, if you ever thought that your pastor was all-wise and omnicompetent, I am sure that the last 11 years of having me as your pastor has completely destroyed your pipe dream in that regard. That is not what a pastor or a leader is supposed to be. But then, here's the flip side. There have been periods in church history and in some places still where people believe that there is no difference at all between the laity and the pastor. That in the economy of the church that we're all absolutely equal and there's no biblical hierarchy that's laid out by the Scripture. But this view is mistaken as well. It doesn't account for the fact that the church has a chief shepherd who is Jesus Christ, and he has appointed shepherds who are supposed to oversee the flock. Christ is the chief shepherd, the head of the church, not any man. Even if he speaks, with, even if he speaks well and has a great smile, even if he has a robe and a little white hat, he's not the head of of the church, even if he has a really nice mullet, he's not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is. Come on. Christ is the head of church. But biblically, God calls and appoints certain men and leaders over his flock under the leadership of Christ. The truth, it seems to me, falls somewhere in between. The congregation is not a bunch of yes men and yes women, is it? But the pastor is not a yes man either. Some of the worst, least effective churches that I have ever seen were churches where people tried to live the pastor's life for him and tried to control everything. They didn't leave room for him to lead the church, much less for the Holy Spirit to even enter into the church. Paul is telling them and he's telling us that the pastor, the minister, is to be respected for the vocation that God's called him to as the shepherd but that they are to carry out certain biblical duties, not as, a, not as a dictator, not as prideful, not as a self-centered person, but as a compassionate yet strong leader. Both clergy and lady need to work hard to get that balance right. And Paul gives us three tasks right here in the first verse that he gives us in today's passage about how the minister is supposed to operate. We see it in verse 12. All right, so let's, if you're taking notes, here they are. We're going to begin to move through the Scripture pretty quickly here. First of all, I'll say this. Here's what the Scripture says. It says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you. The first thing I would say is that you're supposed to respect the minister among you. Respect him for what, you may ask. Respect him if he labors among you. That's what the Scripture says. It says, Respect those who labor among you. You don't have to respect a lazy pastor. You don't have to respect the lazy minister on your staff. But if that person is laboring among you with the right spirit, it says you to respect them. The minister who is at work 
among you. Contrary to what some people may think, let me just clear it up this morning, I do work more than Sundays. I promise. There is a recognition by Paul that the church leadership is a heavy, hard work. That church leaders deserve the respect of the congregation when their effort is done in the right way. The second thing that you see in verse 12 is this. It says that the church leaders are over you in the Lord. Now, of course, church leaders, we know, the Bible is very clear about this, that church leaders, that all Christians, in fact, are called to servanthood, aren't we? But to be servant leaders, which means that servanthood is marked out by authority, when you're a servant and a leader, that there is servanthood with authority. They're, they're, we're, a, a Christian leader is to lead and care in equal measure. And when that happens, that should be respected by the church for the way that leader holds those two things in balance. Servant leadership is the key. You see, the church needs to let a leader lead, but if that leader doesn't serve as he does it, then he is no real leader at all. Third thing, we see it in verse 12. The Bible also says here that leaders... Real leaders are those who admonish you. Now, Paul uses the word nathateo. Now, you don't have to write that down, but in the Greek, it carries with it not a sense of harshness, but it's more like an older brother giving advice and wise counsel to, to his younger brother about the best way to lead his life. If you have good leaders, listen to me, if you have good leaders in the church, they will shoot you straight, they will speak biblical truth even when it's not popular and even when it is not what you want to hear. You need to listen to them if they are biblical. And good leaders will admit when they don't have the answer and they will seek to find it. They won't play the part and act like they know everything. So Paul doesn't shy away from the fact that pastors, that ministers are over the congregation and I know that we see this on all level throughout denominations, but let me just be real honest. I'm not concerned about Baptist or Methodist or Ark or Presbyterian. I'm concerned about what the Bible says. Biblical principles trump everything. Work hard, lead gently but firmly, the Scripture says, with wisdom. If ministers take these responsibilities seriously and behave accordingly, then they deserve the respect and the support of the congregation, if they're living it that way. Verse 13 says, To esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Paul says in verse 13, The congregation is to hold them in highest regard. And crucially, to live in peace with each other is what the scripture said. Now, like I said earlier, Paul's not suggesting that the congregation become yes people and allow the minister to get away with just about anything and talk about their minister more than they talk about Jesus Christ himself. We don't need to be making pastors out to be demigods and treating them as the flavor of the month, who speaks the best, who's the most popular now. But there is something here about respect for the minister that is worked out in love, even when there are disagreements. Look, I've been in the ministry for 20 years, and I've, I've been here since we started this church 11 years ago. And there are a ton of people in this church, and life is not always perfect. Because when you have people, guess what you have? You have conflicts. And, and you have disagreements, and, and you have problems. Too many churches try to sugarcoat Christianity and act like things are perfect all the time. But that's not what we're after, is it? Jesus is the only perfection about us, isn't he, church? I want to say this. There, there, there's nothing, I believe there's nothing that can't be worked out. How often do we see churches where there's no respect for the minister and certain people or a certain person want to, to uh, do everything to undermine the people who are in leadership and, and it's an unbiblical way to behave and it's, sure, it's a surefire way for there to be strife in the church. And that's why the average stay of a pastor is less than three years. How I've made it 11 here, the Lord knows, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I love it. On the contrary, we're, we're called to live in peace with one another, is what the Scripture says. And where there are differences of opinion, it can be worked out in love. That is the one thing that makes me very thankful for this church. I'm just going to shoot you straight this morning. I pray that we always guard the unity that we have. I pray we always do. Now, Paul moves on in verses 14 and 15, and he moves from the relationship of the, of, of the lay member to the leader 
and he talks about relationships between church members, how we as believers rate, relate with one another. How do you relate with the guy down the row from you? You may look down and say, well, I don't know. I have no idea. Verse 14 says, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And verse 15 says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to, get, to do good to one another and to everyone. Now these verses, quite obviously, are about how the members of the church are to offer care to one another, most especially those who are weak or who are vulnerable for whatever reason. And Paul uses a very interesting phrase here when he says, be patient, because it literally means be long-suffering. It means be long-suffering with one another. God's been long-suffering with us, hasn't he? And so we're to be long-suffering with one another because Christ has done the same thing with us. Look, it's not our role to change people. God changes people. We stand for truth as the church, and we live by it, and we love others, and we show them the truth, and we're to be patient in doing it. Paul says, be long-suffering. Be, be very patient with people, just as God has been very patient with us. And then drawing on Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, this is where Paul drew this from. Paul says, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. He said, on the contrary, we're to try to be kind to one another. You can clearly see the ethics of Christ coming through in the Scripture as Paul is talking about it. You see, you see, to be honest with you, this is how we as the church are going to impact the lost. You see, the, the lost are looking at us to see if we actually do what we say. The lost are looking at us to see if we actually live out what the Scripture says here. By the way we treat each other, the, the lost are looking to, to see if we do that if we follow what Christ teaches. The lost are, you know, in all this day of questioning biblical authority, I really believe the lost are looking at us to see if we will actually stand on what we say we believe or if we will bow to the culture and change what we, what we think, you know, that will change with the culture. I think lost are looking to see if we are really standing on what we say we believe in. Do we love each other as he's loved us? Are we genuine? Do we admonish? Do we encourage? Do we help? Are we patient? Do we understand that what goes around comes around doesn't always have to be the answer to our problems? Why? Only because God's done the same for us if we were a believer. What if, what if Christ had had the mentality of what goes around comes around? Third thing. Let's move to how public worship is supposed to happen as the church. Verse 16 all the way through verse 22. Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what's good. Abstain from every form of evil. Paul moves on to describe how the public worship of the church should be. The first impression might be kind of in this list of instructions that Paul is describing what we should do as individual Christians, and certainly we should. But there's a collective purpose in all this. It comes out in verse 26 where Paul says, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss, and uh, that would be very difficult to do on your own, wouldn't it? It's about the corporate body of Christ. Now, we'll talk about that in a minute, about the holy kiss. We'll get to that. Why would Paul want to give instruction on public worship to the Thessalonians so early on in their walk with Christ, when he had devoted so much space already to individual ethics and how they were supposed to live. I think, I think, I really do, as I study the Scripture, that, that the fact is that how we do, and Paul knew this, that how we do public worship as a congregation goes a long way in defining our identity as a Christian community. How we worship, people are looking. How we worship defines who we are. And who we are defines how we worship. I believe that. And so Paul wants to instruct on this community aspect of worship. And I want us to listen real close and hone in on this this morning. It's the development of a self-identity for the church in Thessalonica. And it's true for us at Crosshaven here this morning. How we worship, listen to me, church, how we worship together matters. 
how we worship together matters. The focus, of, listen, the focus of our worship matters. There is nothing better that we could ever hear than this. They truly worship the Lord down there at Crosshaven. They are the real deal down there. They are genuine because they focus on Christ alone. That's a compliment. That's what we desire to hear. So what are the corporate principles that Paul draws on here this morning? Well, in brief, verse 16 says, Rejoice always. That doesn't mean put on the fake Christian hat every day and shake 800 people's hands every day and smile when you don't mean it. That's not what he's talking about. He says, rejoice always. Some versions say, be joyful always. Wait a minute, though. I mean, here's the problem. We're not happy all the time, are we? And we shouldn't fake happiness. The last thing we need is a bunch of fake Christians acting like nothing ever goes wrong in their lives. Reality is that we often face circumstances in life that do detract from our joy, don't we? And it's just denial if we believe otherwise. And we are instructed elsewhere to weep with those who weep, the Scripture says. But fundamentally, listen to me, the Christian community is to identify itself as a joyful community, aren't we? And our public worship should reflect that fact because even when we are not happy, we can have true joy over the simple fact that we are saved. We can look to eternity as believers even when the here and now is difficult. I don't get it. Dull, dead churches are senseless to me. I don't understand why people waste their time. I don't get it, and I don't guess I ever will, because Jesus is alive. We should act alive too, shouldn't we? God is not supposed to be boring, because God is not boring. It's a sad indictment on many churches that worship is far from a joyful experience. Crosshaven, it can never be that way here. Joy in worship has nothing to do with our efforts toward a worship service. But the spirit of the congregation that meets together in that act of worship is what means everything. Amen. Are we expectant to meet with God? Do we want to give to God in our worship? Do we see worship as an opportunity to support and encourage one another? If we come with those sort of expectations on our hearts, our worship will be a joyful experience. But if we come without expectation, and I'm afraid it happens a lot of times in a lot of places and probably here sometimes, but I hope we don't ever anymore. If we come to worship without expectation, not expecting anything from God, not expecting to give anything to God or to others, our worship becomes joyless. It is not about me, and it is not about you. It is about Him. Secondly, verse 17 says that we are told to pray without ceasing or to pray continually. Prayer should be an integral part of our corporate worship. Prayer is not a shopping list that we give to God. It's not a ritualized list of meaningless words. You can sound passionate and mean nothing. We must be a praying church, though. That is why we pray in our services that's why we pray when we sing. That's why we open our altar up and ask people to come and pray. Third, verse 18, we're told to give thanks in all circumstances. That doesn't mean give thanks for all circumstances. Sometimes we're not thankful for what we go through. No one is thankful for cancer or the death of a loved one or a troubled marriage or a struggle with a child or work problems or financial struggles or a sin problem. But no matter what we face, if we know Christ, and that is the key, isn't it? We can still give thanks in those circumstances. We can give thanks that these are momentary struggles in light of eternity. And the same one who overcame sin and death can overcome temporary problems, I promise you. I've watched people with cancer remain thankful for their salvation, even though they were not thankful they were having to take chemo. It's all about keeping an eternal perspective. Did you know that the lack of gratitude is one of the features of pagan depravity 
that was listed by Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Lacking gratitude, I guess what I'm saying is that when we lack gratitude, that's a characteristic of the lost, not of the redeemed of Christ. Over and over again, Paul said the children of God are expected to abound in thanksgiving. Paul adds something here in verse 19 that would be easy to skip over and just move right to the next point, but we won't. He says, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. Now, why did Paul add this in? Because remember two weeks ago when we were talking about brotherly love, we said that people often worry more about what other people are called to do than they are about doing what they are called to do. We, I encourage you that they run your race and let the, uh, let the brother or sister next to you run his or hers. And together, let's work in unity for the good of God's kingdom because the one sitting next to you may have a gift or a talent that you don't have and vice versa. But when we do it together, we can make a di big difference for Christ. And, and I believe Paul is saying don't quench the spirit by being envious or jealous of how God's using the guy down at the end of your row. Be glad and, and get to doing what God wants you to do to serve. I believe Paul also had in mind the moral and the ethical behavior of the believers because he, he, he did it in all the passages leading up to this that often would harm the work of the Holy Spirit. For example, immorality, laziness, prayerlessness, it quenches the spirit. Sexual immorality, it quenches the spirit. Let's be a church where the spirit of God is evidently moving and working among us when God's people are immoral, when God's people are lazy, when God's people are drawn up into sexual immorality, when God's people do gossip, when God's people are prayerless, when God's people are, are unfocused, when God's people could really care less then God's going to work elsewhere. Let's don't quench the Spirit. Verse 20 says, Do not despise prophecies. Now, this is not what it sounds like on the surface. It's not saying, you know, don't, describe the, don't despise the guy who says that Jesus is going to come back on May the 23rd, 2017, exactly something like that. You know, they're making up stuff. Some versions say, Do not treat prophecies with contempt. When it's talking about prophecy, it's talking about biblical teaching. A good way to put it might be to say that we need to always, listen to me, make sure that we're sitting under godly, biblical teaching. We need to remember that the Thessalonians did not have the Bible as we have it, so God's Word was coming to them through prophecies in a way that's not true of us today. We have it right here. This is the prophecy of God. This is the Word of God. And he's encouraging us to sit under the Word of God. I don't, I, let me just say it real simple. What is being taught matters. Cultural relevance and self-help is not God's Word. And he says in verse 21, here's what he said. He said, test everything and hold fast to what is good. What is good? God's Word. What is good? God's Word. For Paul and as it is for us today, we need to be very, very, very weary of people who proclaim, well, the Lord told me that, dot, dot, dot. Well, what does God's Word say? The Scripture says that this will happen as the time draws closer, as Paul was talking about the return of Christ. It's, the Scripture says this will happen, and it is happening in our society, and it's, and it's affecting the church. The Scripture said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, listen to it real close, it says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Don't you think that's what's happening in our world today? Don't you think that's what's happening in the so-called church today? What about what God says? We live in a culture that interprets God as they want to interpret Him. It is their own idea or their own passion that they are promoting. And either consciously or subconsciously, by attributing by attributing it to God, they are expecting that the idea will be taken on board without question. Now, I'm not saying this morning that God doesn't still speak to people, but like Paul says, we are to test everything. So how do we do that? A few simple questions we need to be asking. Does what people teach match the Scriptures? 
Does what they teach glorify God? Does what they teach sit in accordance with the gospel message of Jesus Christ? What is the character of the person who is teaching this? Do they have a mature biblical faith or an immature faith that you're not sure is biblical? To what extent does what people believe or teach build up the body of Christ? If there's any doubt in response to any of those questions, then we should be very wary to accept what's been said as words from God. Paul says, only hold to what is good. What is good? What's good is what's in his word. If it goes against anything that's in his word, then it's not good, right? I'm just going to go here. That's why I am so upset by all this ruling on homosexual marriage licensing. There are pastors and church leaders left and right that are bowing to the culture. Rob Bell and his wife just came out yesterday with an article that says, we believe the church is going to finally accept it. The church is going to bow down and the church is going to accept it. This was a man who 10 years ago proclaimed Christ as the inerrant Savior of the world and God's word is unchanging in 10 years' time. There are pastors and church leaders left and right bowing to the culture, making up what they think God thinks, and they are not standing up for much less believing in the infallible, unchanging word of God. And it is not just the issue of homosexuality. That's the flavor of the day. But it's not just that. It's happened with all kinds of issues. We want to justify sin in the name of building earthly kingdoms. Thank God when leaders and churches stand on truth in love. Because it's only going to get harder, I promise you. And we must be grounded, and we must be filled with truth, and we must be filled with joy in Christ. And we must offer hope to the lost. We need to give them something of substance that they want to run to. And that they want to cling to. Not bow to the culture and lose sight of the one thing that actually can save them. Verse 22 says, Abstain from any form of evil. How can you do that? If you're okay with or if you're unclear about, or if you're not willing to stand on what God clearly, clearly, clearly says is sin. And so finally, Paul comes to his conclusion, his final comments to them in anticipation of seeing them again soon. Paul's wanting to see them again. Now, if you read the Scripture and look at it, look at the whole New Testament, it would be five more years until Paul would actually get to see them face to face. So here's what he says in verse 23. He gives them a blessing. He said, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that backdrop again. At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is coming again, church. Are you ready? Do you know Christ? If you do know Christ, then how are you doing in your faith? How are you living? How are you on sin? How's your marriage? How's your family? How are you doing as a dad or a mom? How good of a friend are you? Are you serving or are you indifferent? Is God using you to make a difference? Paul says, may the Lord sanctify you completely, set you apart, make you different, anticipating being ready for the day when Jesus comes again. Look at verse 24. The scripture says he will do it. He will make you different. You just need to let him. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it, says verse 24. And then we have this moment of true care and concern in verses 25 and 26. Paul says, brother, pray for us. Paul says, I'm praying for you, but I just want to tell you, I need you to pray for me too. Look, let me just say as your pastor, I pray for you. I need you to pray for me too. And some of you, I know a lot of you do. But we need to be praying for one another. Our staff, Josh and Aaron and Allison and Amanda and Anita and all of our staff, we need you praying for us. We want to pray for you. We need to be praying for one another. 
And and then probably one of the most uncomfortable verses in the passage comes next. In verse 26, he says, Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. So I just want to ask you to turn to your neighbor right now on your right and your left and just go ahead and uh, let's... I'm just kidding. (laughs) There are four places in the New Testament that refer to the holy kiss. In each instance, the Greek word denotes a kiss that is sacred, physically pure, and morally blameless. It it was a common custom in in most nations, and it still is in some, for people to kiss each other at meeting or parting to display their love. I'd like to see some of our hunters here in church doing that. (laughs) That would be awesome. But it was sincere affection and friendship for each other. The kiss is called holy. It was there to distinguish it as something different than one with a sexual connotation or it was different than a deceitful kiss like Judas gave to Jesus. So in the New Testament times, the holy kiss was a sign of greeting like brothers and sisters, much like the modern handshake. So today, let's just go with the handshake or maybe even the appropriate church guy side hug, okay? Let's, let's, uh, let's go with that. We'll be okay with that. And then he closes his letter by making them accountable. Look at verse 27. He said, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter. Paul is pretty straightforward. Hey, I'm sending this to you. You better read it. He said, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. I've written this, and it is very important, so I'm holding you accountable. Read it to everyone. That's what he's saying. Paul was saying, look, don't put it in the pile of mail on your desk and forget it's there. Read it. Put it on the screen. Put it on the screen in front of the church. Read it out loud. Make sure everybody's there when you do. And then he says, he closes with verse 28, and he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul concludes in verse 28, just like he began in chapter 1, verse 1, when we started eight weeks ago. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It all starts and ends with the grace of Christ, doesn't it, church? Grace is everything. Without God's grace, we have no hope. I believe this. If every church were to read this, study it, seek to live this out, what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, then the witness of Christ for the church in this nation and this world would be completely transformed. I, I believe that. We would do what we do better if we really took it to heart. I want to invite you this morning as we close to just join me at the altar as we pray. Um, We'll ask our church leaders, our church members, maybe you're here for the first time and you think, boy, that's pretty uncomfortable. I'm sorry. Just come on and join us. I want to ask you to come and pray as we have an altar call, as we come and pray together. If you don't know Christ, would you come and share that with someone? We'll tell you what it means to know Christ and how to have a relationship with Him. And... uh, And if you need someone just to come aside with you and pray with you individually, I invite you to do that as well, okay?